uh, we're off to the talk. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, hopefully everybody's gonna have fun. So let's just get uh, down to business. What is hexagonal architecture? So first of all, it's a concept which was formalized by Mr. Alistair Coburn. Um, Alistair Coburn is one of the original proponents of Agile. So uh, he didn't just bring his contribution to the software development world from a technical perspective, but also from, from a process perspective. And he's there with big names like Robert Martin and Ken Beck and Martin Fowler and so on. And what's, what's its purpose? So its purpose is to, and I quote, allow an application to be equally driven by users, programs, automated tests or bad scripts and to, de to be developed and tested in isolation from its eventual runtime devices and databases. And that sounds really, really nice, doesn't it? But let's be honest, we try to do that all the time with our layered architecture as well. So the question is, why should we change that? Well, let's that's the question that i'm going to try to answer through this presentation let's have a look let's have a challenge let's have a, a go at layered architecture because it's so often used that maybe we just forget why why we use it so um to continue let's have a look um first we'll have a look at how hexagonal and uh, the layered architecture are different, and we're also going to set up some comparison criteria just to know what uh, what we're looking at. And then we're going to have a short demo. And um, after the demo, after we, you will have also some uh, semi hands on experience with hexagonal, we'll be able to compare the two approaches. And then we'll also look at the real world impact in projects mostly related to uh, microservices and to projects in general. Um, okay, let's start with a recap on the layered architecture. So what you can see right now is a web application. Uh, it's a very simple. It has only the regular, uh, the essential layers, let's say. It has a UI, uh, it has a service layer and a repository layer. And each layer is supposed to have knowledge only on the layer below it. So, and when I say knowledge, only what, it ex what the layer below it exposes as far as behavior and models go. And this is a very good design. It's very easy to implement and it works with this concept of separation of concerns to decouple your code and to split it based on responsibilities. And that's something really cool. And I think that's why it's used probably in millions of applications. I don't have a number for that or a statistics, but works big um, but keeping keeping a design like this clean is a real challenge and what happens usually because it's chained so it goes from left to right there's a high risk that layer specific choices will end up used in other layers so not for what they are meant to be used and the easiest example i can think of is uh, using your entities as domain objects. You, you have entities and you define them in the repository layer and they're supposed to abstract your database model. But then uh, you don't add an extra model, you don't add a domain objects or DTOs and then you take your entities and you expose them straight, uh, straight through your UI. And that's something which we can do at the beginning of, uh, of development because we are just building a simple CRUD. It's a proof of concept. Maybe it's going to evolve, maybe not. But we're, we're doing this. Everybody has done this. I know I've done it a couple of times. And uh, we'll probably keep on doing it in the future as well. But then things get a bit more complicated as the project evolves. So what happens when in the DTOs, in the UI, and you don't have DTOs, remember that, you need to return some derived property. So instead of a first name, last name separation, you need to return a full name. What do you do? Well, one easy thing to do is to add a transient property to your entity. And people are doing that. And what happens is that they're taking requirements which are 
um, are concerned with the UI layer of your application and they're implementing it in the repository layer because that object is accessible. It doesn't matter that it's coming through a service, that object is still visible and can be used. So what happens in other circumstances? What if I need to return a report? Um, okay, how do I do a report? Well, usually I take more than one entity and I mix it up, then I create my DTO or maybe my domain object, and then I add mappers. But then I have half of my application done with mappers and so on for the report, and the other half uh, straight with entities for, um, for the regular operational um, um, responsibilities of the application. And as you can see, I mean, these are very, uh, very common uh, things we need to do. And these small changes um, make our application slowly turn into a big ball of mud. And after a few years of uh, making these um, compromises, which maybe you're not even aware of, and the technology changes and the management says, okay, we need to modernize every platform, whatever, then the only chance is to invest heavily in a co complete rewrite of the system. And that's not necessarily good or fun, but we have to do it. Hexagonal architecture is also known as sports and adapters, and it shifts this idea of a top-down approach used in the layered architecture. Uh, top-down, left, right, doesn't matter, depends uh, how your screen is turned. Uh, it, it shifts it to an inside-outside approach, and that's why it's called hexagonal, because the hexagon is a good shape to showcase that you have something inside of it and something outside of it. And the inside of the application contains this domain, which is made of your domain object and your business logic uh, use cases, and ports. And the ports are used to communicate with, uh, with the outside. So um, you have a presentation port, which is an output port for your application. It's where you send data and you have a data port, which is an input port for your application where you can get data. And each of these ports has one or more adapters. Um, and you can have any adapters for uh, any, any number of adapters for each port. They just need to implement the same, uh, the same contract. So what, what you can see here is that with this, with this approach, we have a clear separation between uh, business logic, which is contained within the domain, and that's what makes your application different from any other application on Earth, and the infrastructure, which is uh, the system you get connected to. Because let's say that even if your business logic remains constant, your infrastructure might change. When you shift to a AWS, for example, it's going to change. It's going to change a lot. And uh, if, um, if it's tightly coupled, that's not a good thing. So let's let's think a bit uh, to our previous example, and we um, need to define our database model. We're going to do it in the repository adapter. And that's uh, that's pretty clear. The question is, can we propagate the entities to the UI adapter? And the answer is no, we can't because the domain is not aware of the object which are in the repository adapter. We cannot do that short circuiting and um, by the simple design and by having this simple uh, change of direction in, in dependencies, we can see that that, that problem is broken right, uh, right down at the root. So that's, that's something which I like about this pattern is that it's very well thought out. So first, it, challenge, it challenges you to think at a conceptual level about your app, where each piece of code should go. And um, well, we do that with the layered architecture as well. But the advantage is that afterwards, it enforces your choices through this dependency inversion mechanism. And it's just that. It's a simple change of dependency. Um, OK, we talked a bit about the layered and the hexagonal architecture. We have an overall idea. We still don't know what it means, but it's OK. Let's set up some principles for comparison. And uh, for principles, we go back to Robert Martin, um, who defined the solid principles. And in addition to them, he defined six other principles. 
uh, three centered around package cohesion and other three centered around package dependency. So how the packages should depend on, uh, on each other. And what you have here is the dependency inversion principle. This is the D in solid. And probably everyone knows that oh, you need to depend on abstractions, not on concretions or on interfaces, not on implementations of those interface, interfaces. And then you have uh, all these package dependencies principle. The first one is the acyclic dependencies principle. And that says that the dependency graph of a package must have no cycle. So you don't have to have circular, you must not have circular dependencies between cycle, uh, between uh, packages. Part of that problem is uh, handled because we modularize our each our application uh, in, I don't know, Maven or Gradle or some form of modules, which don't allow um, this circular dependencies to arise. But then within a module, that's where the fun begins. Um, and that's where there's opportunity to have cyclic dependencies between packages. Cyclic dependencies are a cause for uh, couple code and for the ball of mud syndrome, let's say. Then we have the stable dependencies principle and this states that we should depend in the direction of stability. And Uncle Bob comes with a way to measure this uh, instability. How many outgoing dependencies a package has over the total number of uh, dependencies it has, so outgoing and incoming. And if we're looking at a package which has no outgoing dependencies, then instability is zero, and that's a perfectly stable package. Uh, the same way a package which only depends on others, it's a perfectly unstable package. And the last one is the stable abstractions principle. Um, abstractness increases with stability. And the metric here is kind of vague. Uh, he proposes considering a total number um, of abstract classes over the total number of classes from your package, but then it's difficult to define what abstract means. And um, so it's, it's not as exact and as confident as the one for the stable dependencies uh, principle. Okay, we have the layered architecture, we have the hexagonal, we have the principles for comparison. It's time to start the demo. Uh, for that one, I've prepared an application. It's a service which manages car rentals, creates uh, car rentals. And that one depends on uh, another service, a core service for users and cars. And it saves its data into a Postgres database. Um, you're gonna see a bunch of technologies used within the demo. We have Spring Boot, we have Open API and the API first. Uh, approach use. Uh, we have map struct for mapping between uh, objects. And we have Lombok uh, to remove some boilerplate code. And the initial state of the system looks something like this. You have your boot module, which brings this whole um, specific configuration for Spring Boot. So it's separate from the others. Uh, then we have the controller module, they're all gonna be Maven modules. We have the controller module, it's self-explanatory service and repository as well. And the client core module, which is um, a client um, implemented using OpenFane to the, um, to the other service. You'll have the code at the end, no worries about that. So I'm not gonna show you technology specific information like, oh, look, uh, this is how the client is implemented. Doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that we're going to try to convert it to this state. So we have um, here, it's, yes, it's the same left to right view, but I'd like you to imagine because it was really difficult to draw otherwise that the service is at the center of the universe. It's the sun in our, uh, in our solar system. And then we have uh, the repository, the client um, and the controller, which all depend on the service. And then we have the boot module, which is gonna come with this extra Spring Boot uh, container and depend on all of them as well. 
but as you can see, the service is the center is at the center of the dependency tree. Okay, uh, let's uh, shift a bit. Um, it will take a minute to shift my screen to the um, uh, to the code. Yeah, let's see how we can minimize that as well. That's perfect. Um, okay. We have the car hire rental. We have the code. For now, it started. I'm just going to show you that it works. Um, this is the API. We have a post to add a new rental. And I'm just going to execute it. And I'm going to check for the answer. Yes, I have a new ID added to the database, ID 20. OK. And now we're starting the, the shift. Let's, let's start the shift. And let's see a bit where we have our dependencies. Um, let's look in the, in the rental service, because that, that's where our logic is. And we have this implementation, which is a default rental service. This one has this uh, method, create new rental, which is implemented. Um, OK. So, and this depends on user API, car API, and rental repository, and we'd like to, um, uh, to change that. So how are we going to change that? So first, we need to break this dependency and depend, depend on abstractions. I'm just gonna call them managers. And first I'm going to define a user manager. It's going to be an interface. It's going to be called user manager. And it has to do something like get an user by ID, which is an integer. And let's say optional. We have a user DO object. And we have get user. OK, that's nice. Uh, let's change it here as well. Okay, and this one is an optional. It doesn't have, has body, but it has is present. Uh, the car is pretty similar, so I'm just gonna copy paste it and I'm gonna say, okay, car manager has a car DO and it has get car. And that's that, okay. Um, car manager, gonna have to rename this as well, to car manager. And this one is present. Okay, that's perfect. And what we still need to do is save. Um, let's see how, how we do that. Basically, we need to return an ID from this save method. And I'm going to do a rental manager. And what this is going to do, it's going to return an integer. It has a method save, and it saves a rental DO. OK. Perfect. Let's replace that here as well. And we have something to rental here. No, we don't need that. We just say return rental manager save example. Perfect. We don't have any more dependencies on any other on any other uh, provider. So that means we can remove our dependencies from the POM as well. We don't depend on the client core and we don't depend on the repository. Okay? That's that's step 1. Okay, but now we need to provide implementations to this uh, to these managers. 
So first of all, let's um, let's do the client ones. Let's uh, let's go here and um, add a manager package. First, we're going to have to add a dependency uh, to depend on our uh, service. Okay, uh, let's refresh our Maven dependencies as well. And then under manager, I'm gonna implement the um, car manager IMPL. Perfect. Okay, uh, this one is a component or maybe a service. It depends on how you use it, but it implements, implements car manager. And this one has get car. Um, sorry, it's a class. Just gonna say get car again. Perfect. And this one needs to know about the API. So this is the only place where we know about the API. And we have the car API. And then we also have a need for a mapper, which I'm going to add when I'm gonna do the actual mapping. Um, okay, and here I'm gonna do car API, get car. And this one returns a response entity of car DTO, car response. Okay, and now I need to map it into an optional. So it's gonna be something, okay, if car response has body, then we're gonna add the code here, else return optional empty. Okay, return optional. of car response get body but the problem is this one is a dto and i need a do here fortunately i have already some mappers defined and i'm just going to move them here so we have the cardio mapper and i'm going to uh, move the user as well so these ones need to go up here in the mapper it's Okay, continue, doesn't matter. Do refactor, perfect. And we have our mappers here. Cardio mapper and user DTO mapper. These are implemented using map struct. You can see the mapper annotation there. Um, and we have a car DTO to cardio, that's perfect. That's exactly what we need. Okay, and private final cardio mapper to cardio. Okay, so we have an implementation for the car manager. Uh, let's do a similar one for the user manager. Okay, component. Let's do implement. Let's add the user API and let's add the user DO mapper. Okay, and then we need to get user. I'm just gonna be, just gonna do a bit of copy paste programming because it's the exact same code. It's not the best practice, but it's a good practice during a live demo. Just gonna say this is user response. And here we don't have, we have user DTO. And if the user response has body, then we need to, we need to 
map it to user do okay we've taken care also of optimizing the imports basically this is this this is all this is all we've updated the dependencies we have the dependency with service um okay we have one more step to do the same for the repository we just need to implement that save method and uh, let's say um we have the rental manager IMPL. And I'm going to annotate this with a service because it's a repository. It uses a repository. Um, I forgot to do, to do something beforehand. So I didn't add my dependency on service here. OK, there it is. Oh, it's still not there. There it is. And we mentioned already that this one um, needs a repository. Okay, it's gonna need mappers as well, but we're gonna add them afterwards. And this one, what this does is save. Perfect. And what we got to do here is say, first, we need a rental object. And we need to map it. And in order to map it, we have this rental DO mapper, which I'm going to move in a second. Okay. Now I can completely delete this from here. I have this rental DO mapper. Um, and let's try to add it here, private final. Okay. And the rental should be something like rental DO mapper to rental from the um, rental deal seems i have a possible problem here um i don't need this method at all so i'm just going to delete it at least not for this use case and that's that and now what i need to do is do rental repository save for my rental then i'm going to say return rental get ID. Perfect. Any other problems here? Probably, but they'll, they'll, they will be gone when we'll recompile. Uh, let's check this service and let's see um, what, what other issues we might have. But basically we shifted to dependencies. The controller already depends on the, uh, on the service. And what we still need to do here is to ensure that the boot module depends on the controller, the client, and the repository, because it needs to, to have access to all of them to create the, the, the whole spring context. Okay, let's run a clean install and see whether, whether that, uh, that works. It would be a nice surprise to, to have this working on the first try. It has happened before. I don't know whether it's going to happen now. Um, it takes some seconds, mainly because it generates that open API first approach I was talking about. It generates a bunch of classes, the DTOs and the clients and the server definitions for, uh, for our service. But yeah, OK, so build completed. It's successful. And that, that's it. Let's run the application, see that it works, and then let's have a look at its um, at it, at its structure again. There's always a chance that although the build is working, then uh, when you try to run it and the context tries to create itself, um,
some bin is not found or some dependency has been missed or something like that. Um, doesn't seem to be the case since that it's working that it it's working fine. Let's try to execute it. Let's be optimistic. Okay, ID 21. Don't believe me. I have them here in the database as well. So you can see it's from the database. Um, yeah. So we have shifted the structure of a very simple project in 10 minutes from layer to hexagonal. Uh, let's see exactly what, what uh, we are up against. So let's look at the default rental service. Um, what you need to see here is that right now in the service, I have these kind of ports defined. It's not a car port, a rental port, and a user manager port. It's, this is a data port. All the managers here are a data port. And then whatever definition you have under the rental service, that's your, uh, that's your uh, presentation port. Because this is what's visible to the outside, the rental service. And this is this, whatever you have in this manager object, these are the, um, the contract, the domain creates with the other components of the application. And you can see that this doesn't have anything related to Spring or to any other technology. This is, this is so agnostic to everything that it's, it's simply your, your business logic. There are some additions here like required arcs constructor, this is Lombok. And you also have service, which, which says that, okay, I'm creating a bin here. And this comes from the parent POM. But even if you would want right now to, to have no dependency on Spring, then that, that would be so easy. You, you would just go here in the boot module. And here, instead of just doing this, you would be doing this as well. And you would have something like public rental service and return new default rental service. It has the dependencies because uh, of the, um, so it needs these dependencies, but then you can auto wire them as well in there. And it's, it's really, really, really easy. So you can add doing this and car manager and um, rental manager. And then you have all this separation between how a bin, how you define your business logic and then how it's, how it's built together. And it's, it's, it's easy. So what's, what's the most impress, impressive thing from my perspective is this one. You have a POM with no dependencies. And that's, that's perfect. You have your domain logic written in Java and that's it. You can, you, you can move it. I mean, you don't know that uh, the user or the car come from a Postgres SQL database. You can shift it to Mongo overnight. And this, this piece of service of domain won't know, won't know the difference because all that it matters is that the new adapter you're going to write is going to implement these um, th these managers from from the data port. Okay, um, yeah, I think that that was it for the demo. Let's go back to our comparison. Okay, so um, for uh, for our comparison, let's uh, let's look a bit first at the layered architecture. Let's see how it amounts to the principles which uh, we have defined. So dependency inversion principle, yeah, we kind of do it in layers because we have all those uh, interfaces, uh, service def definition, service implementation, repository definition, repository implementation, and so on. We kind of do it. Uh, then the acyclic dependencies principle, we possibly, we're possibly doing it. I mean, uh, this is something to be wary of on any project, Maven and Gradle and uh, any other type of technology that allows to modularize your application. 
doesn't normally allow for cyclic dependencies, but it's still a good thing to keep an eye out using a tool like, uh, I don't know, maybe IntelliJ has a, has a dependency analyzer for it, for example, and you can periodically check that to avoid the uh, circular dependencies between packages. And then you have the stable dependencies principle, and this kind of depends on context. I mean, each layer depends, uh, each layer depends on a bunch of technologies. The controller depends on the Spring Web Starter, and then the service depends on, uh, on the repository. And that means that, okay, there's a bunch of uh, dependencies, transitive dependencies coming from the repository and so on and so forth. So you, you can say that um, because we depend on the repository, the repository has less dependencies than, than we have. No, it, it, has, it might have more, it might have less. It's, it, there's really no color, correlation there uh, between, uh, between layers and the direction in which they depend upon each other. And then we have the stable abstractions principle, which is a solid no. Um, and pretty much because although you can calculate like metrics and say, okay, this one has five abstract classes and 10 implementations, and the other one has two and three, uh, and you get the numbers at the end, you're not gonna have anything like, um, okay, you're not gonna have anything like a relation between them. Uh, for hexagonal, on the other hand, yes, dependency inversion principle, it's, um, it improves by placing the interfaces in the domain. And that, if, uh, that dependency is inverted, not only when you're looking at classes, but also when looking at packages. Um, acyclic dependencies principle, yeah, it's not a, a definite yes, but you probably have less chance of creating transitive uh, uh, cyclic dependencies, mainly because you have less objects traveling from one layer to another. You don't have that. Um, you could have a cyclic dependency who, um, um, sim simply because you're using um, objects and methods from, uh, from services on, from the repository. So it's, it's a bit more likely. It's not, it's not really a huge difference here. Stable dependencies principle, yes we have the domain, the service, which is completely stable. It doesn't depend on anything and everything else depends on it. And arguably also, it's also the most abstract. So the stable abstract abstractions principle is there as well. Um, why I say arguable, arguably because it depends on how you define, define the concept of abstraction. Um, I'm sure it has the most the, the most uh, abstract classes uh, compared to the implementation. Mo most of them are abstract. And if you think from a conceptual perspective, you can consider your model abstract as well. Okay, that's, uh, that's enough for design, but let's see how this helps us with microservices. Um, for microservices, the principles are the 15 factors, which are defined by VMware, uh, they build on the original 12 factor cloud native um, uh, factors for cloud native apps defined by Heroku. And they're adding three more. One of them is the first one, API first. And the hexagonal architecture uses this approach internally. So the domain defines the ports and the ports are contracts and the ports are API. And it gets you in the, that mindset where you work with contracts and you know that when you change a contract, you're gonna have changes and you're gonna have impact. And it, it, it reflects very well on the approach when you move from integrating the layers, uh, the components of a system, when you're integrating system, because that, that's the same approach there. You have a contract and based on that contract, you start development in parallel. And the, the other one where I see impact is backing services. Um, this states that cloud native apps should treat backing services at, as attached resources. And this, this hexagonal architecture implements this implicitly. Um, what does it mean to have attached resources? So it doesn't, uh, the application doesn't need to be aware that uh, a certain database is local or in the cloud or on a on-premise server or anywhere else. 
or that there's a guy writing manually on a piece of paper. It doesn't matter as long as it uh, um, as it uh, has the same um, type of connection parameters. So it's not something which is um, which is built into the um, uh, whole system when, when it's uh, deployed. And the hexagonal architecture takes this even further because you don't even care what type of database. You don't even care whether it's a database or whether it's a satellite. You, you, don't, you don't give uh, two cents on what's happening in, in the back and you can change things easily. And this is an approach which was used also by Netflix. There's a, there's a link in, in the resources um, on how they, change from relational to non-relational uh, using hexagonal architecture. And if all of this hasn't convinced you yet to at least try it, then please keep in mind that hexagonal architecture equals flexibility. And flexibility is key in avoiding the project paradox because there are a lot of very big decisions we take at the beginning of the project. And that's usually the time when we know the least about what we're going to build. And hexagonal architecture with this built-in flexibility will allow you to defer those decisions until you have more information. And then, then that's, uh, that's definitely gonna, gonna help you on the, long line, on the long run. That's all what I had on the subject. I would be happy to hear your questions. Um, you're gonna see this uh, QR code. It's got my contact information. I'm gonna drop them in the chat as well. And you also have these, uh, this link of resources and interesting reads. Um, I'm just gonna leave it, uh, it's gonna be, I'm just gonna leave a link to, uh, to the whole presentation uh, stack as well. And that, that was it for today, thanks a lot. And let's go Thank back. you Vlad, thank you Vlad. Very good talk, really appreciate it. Is yeah, it okay perfect. if I leave this slide a bit uh, on longer or uh, should I just... Uh, sure, by all means, no worries. Leave it. Uh, okay, yeah, perfect. also you can uh, paste the links, uh, the link in the in the chat if you want, and, but we can also uh, put it on our website afterwards. So perfect, perfect, perfect. Then everybody can uh, access it. Mm -hmm. So Dan had a question. He yeah. asked me before you ended the se the, your session, but I couldn't answer. So. Yeah, he couldn't do it. Uh, I was wondering um, uh, what would be the drawbacks of a hexagonal architecture system? Is it for everyone? Is it yeah. for any project? Is it for any? It's, uh, I, I'd say it's not for proof of concept. So if you want to get something out very, very quickly, I don't think it's, uh, or something which is very simple. I mean, then you should just go and use something like Spring Data REST, which exposes your database through a controller. Uh, because what what it happens is uh, in in the first example I gave you saw that we define our de database model and we use it up to the controller and if you look at the hexagonal that's not possible anymore and you actually end up with a separate data model in each of the layers in each of the adapters and you have your domain model and you have your repository model and you have your DTOs and you have all these mappers there's obviously technology and MapStruct is a great example, which helps you uh, do those types of mappings easily, but it still takes time. So and that it, that would be a this drawback. Would, this would have been my follow-up question because indeed, uh, as I said, there is some, let's say, heaviness involved. So you have extra classes that you need to create. So uh, what are the tools that can help you generate uh, um, yeah, so I've, I've used um, MapStruct, which is a great mapper, uh, annotation driven, it's very nice, and it has a great documentation. That's, that's one of, of, it's one of the few frameworks of which I can say that it has a great documentation. If you read the Spring documentation, it's a bit high level. Uh, when you have issues, you go to Stack Overflow, not to the official documentation, or then first to the to Stack Overflow and then uh, you actually understand what's written in the documentation, <laughs> that happens as well. But uh, for MapStruct, it's really great. It's, uh, you, it doesn't have that many Stack Overflow questions as well, because, not because there's no need, uh, there's no community of users, but there's no need, it's just that good. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So, so I was wondering uh, in this in this hexagonal architecture uh, where you've got the concern separated and everything. So, where is the place of the non-functional requirement? So, how do you do the profiling, the monitoring? Well, uh, you you can still imagine that this is packaged as a as a single application, and basically. Uh, profiling is a is a cross cutting concern. It depends on uh, at what level you're you're gathering metrics. So I'd say that whatever you're doing for um, for a regular layered application, uh, you could do for one with hexagonal as well. But there might be uh, a drawback. There maybe there might be some um, dependencies which you're gonna need. To, to tie to your domain. And basically, if you manage to find a good solution to not do that, that's great. But if you can't, then you can't, and that's life. Right. You have to trade off. Yeah, always, always. Once again, excellent talk, excellent uh, conversation, very insightful.